While the IT is being set up, and I will then introduce this evening's speaker, I just wanted to share with you um, some sad news that um, we have just received. Um, I've just been told that Dr. Ghanim Wahida, who many of you will know, um, based in Cambridge, but uh, a long career as a Paleolithic archaeologist working in both Iraq and the Arabian Peninsula, um, has died. He was a, a student or a PhD student of Joe Notes in Cambridge um, in the 1970s, and clearly uh, a great loss to the discipline. So I'm sorry to, um, to pass on that sad news to you, but now we can turn to uh, a really much more positive um, story, and I'd like to introduce this evening's speaker. It's an enormous pleasure to welcome to the Academy a, a great friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Franco D'Agostino. He's a uh, professor of Assyriology, senior researcher in Assyriology in the Institute of Oriental Studies at Sapienza, the University of Rome, a specialist in Sumerian cuneiform, um, studied material from Ebla and focused uh, work on the Third Dynasty of Ur, text from the sites of Ur, Uma, Giesu, and Drehem, among others. He's published um, on Nabonidus, Gilgamesh, Babylonian literature, um, but for this evening's talk, he will focus on the work that he's been doing as the director of the Italian archaeological mission at Abu Dbera, the longest standing current archaeology project in southern Iraq. So please join me uh, very warmly in welcoming Thank you. Dr. Very much for uh, me. Thank you. So first of all, it's a great pleasure for me to be here. I've been invited one and a half year ago <laughs> because <laughs> there was no space before, so that means that the, you are very busy in the busy with, uh, with your activities on Iraq. So, what I'm going to tell you today is the history of the project uh, and uh, the way in which it, it, uh, we developed it in the seven years we have been working in Iraq. Let's start from what we knew from Iraq when we started eight years ago. Iraq was in, in war. It, it, these were the images that we got from the media at that time. Uh, drones used for war, uh, soldiers, and so on. Uh, I have been working in the, uh, what they, was called the PRT, the Provincial Reconstruction, uh, Reconstruction Team, in, uh, in the base of Talil, in the south of Iraq. The base of Talil uh, uh, was the base where, uh, at that time, the uh, city of Ur was uh, put inside. I mean, it was inside the base at that time. Then it was put out uh, during the 2010, perhaps, or 2009. And uh, uh, this is, these are pictures of important sites of uh, southern Iraq taken by a, a military drone of the Americans. They, I asked them to take pictures just to have an idea of what was happening in this site, and they were kind enough to change the coordinates of the drone in order to take pictures for me, and it was very kind of them. As you can see in Umma here, we have a terrible situation. Uh, the whole there are loot lootings. The Umma is well, perhaps the most looted uh, site of southern Iraq, or perhaps of entire Iraq. Uh, let's go. We had been told also that it was very dangerous to be there because of the ur enriched uranium that was used by the Americans during the first uh, war, not during the, the, the war uh, we had our <laughs> in the, the, the second one, the second Gulf War. So we went there with the Geiger uh, counter in order to see what was happening. And we were lucky enough to see that nothing happened, that zero was the, the, the radiation that we had. So there are many, a lot of big mythologies on Iraq. And it was one of that, of those, I mean. Then this is a picture uh, I took, or yeah, not me, but a friend of mine took in, in, uh, in the base of Talil. At that time, I told you it was inside the uh, Ur, the Zikurat, this is the Zikurat of Ur, was inside the, the base, and it was the way in which it was used also. Well, well it is very strong, nothing happened to the, to, the, to the Zikurat, admittedly, but it was not in, nice. The, the, what, in, what is important is that we arrived there, and the Iraqis decided to give us an escort. 
Well, two different escorts. One of the police of archaeology, as they said. That is people who work with us when we are on the site. And then the normal police who is in charge of us when we go or come back from the site or we go somewhere else. We are always accompanied, still today. But this was the way in which they <laughs> were with us. So we understood from the very first moment that nothing would have happened. And inshallah, nothing will happen because we have, we, we have been working now eight years, seven years. We are planning the eight campaigns. So this is our Iraq, which is quite different from the media images of this country you have, I mean, in the media, in the television, and so on. So it is one of our goals to explain, to teach a different Iraq to the people who are uh, ready to listen. Well, this was the first group. We started uh, in 2011, at the end of 2011, and it was the first group we have. As you see, the policemen are always with us. So they become friends. Uh, we know everything about them. We have been invited to the, to the weddings and so on. So this is the, the situation there. Uh, so we started this work. The man in the middle is Abdul Amir al-Hamdani, who is perhaps the, one of the most important person for us to uh, get the permit of excavations. Uh, I remember uh, one day we met with uh, Kais, Dr. Kais, uh, Hussein Rashid, who is the director, still is the director after 10 years of the State Board for Antiquities and Heritage. And in front of the Zikurat, there was a terrible sandstorm in that day, but he told me that whatever proposal came, would have come through Abdul Amir, he would have said yes. And in three months, they said me yes. It was, for me, unexpected. And then it was started a, a complicated period to organize the first campaign to find money. As you know, the money is the, most big, the biggest problem in humanities. Well, so we decided to work in Abu Tbeira. Abu Tbeira is a site, 45 uh, more or less uh, hectares, in the south of Nasiriya, 15 kilometers to, from Ur where we have the mission, the house of the mission, and where we live still today. Why we decided to, 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 to study this study, to, to start digging this site? Because it, is, it lies in an oil area, and the uh, uh, Iraqi oil company want, uh, applied for making new uh, soundings for uh, oil in that area. So the SBH wanted to know whether it was safe to give this permit or not. So this was one of the first reasons why Abdul Amir proposed us to excavate Abu Tbeira. Uh, in Abu Tbeira, indeed, there is, uh, the, the site is divided in four nice, more or less, uh, uh, parts, uh, similar parts, uh, by a pipeline uh, from south to north, going to Baghdad from Basra, and going directly through the site, and from an ancient canal, which uh, cross, uh, the, the, divides the site in two parts. Uh, we are going to speak about the canal a uh, moment later. What is interesting is that this is a, an image of the Corona satellite. Corona satellite is a very important uh, satellite uh, for archaeology because it was used by the Americans from 1959, I think, until 1972. And then every day, it passed through the, around the world, taking millions of pictures in this period. And these pictures have been declassified by Clinton, by President Clinton, and now they are at disposal of the, of the archaeologists who want to use them. And uh, this is a, a, a corona picture of the site of Abu Tubeira, and as you can see, there is the, uh, the canal, but there is no pipeline. It is taken at the end of the 60s. So the pipeline has been built probably in the middle of the 70s. Now, uh, this, uh, these pictures tell a story, because one day we came to uh, the, the fourth or the third or fourth campaign, and suddenly we have seen that the oil company had made work, works around the tell in order to put a second pipeline directly near the old one. So we decided not to come back anymore. We were very upset. And this woman, who, Usal is the name, was that, uh, at that time the director of the antiquities of Nasiriya, and she was really very strong, and she managed to oblige the Iraqi oil company to make a long 
the tour, let's say, of the pipeline, which costed $1,500,000, and they were, were very upset with us about that. But now the pipeline <laughs> goes around <laughs> the, the, the site of Abtbera. And th this is a good sign of the power a superintendent has in Iraq. You know that in Italy, the superintendent can stop whatever work you want to do in whatever place of Italy. And the same power, because it is the, the Iraqi law has been written according to the Italian law. Nobody knows that, but it is. Because Italy shares with Iraq what? The richness in archaeology. Yeah, the two countries which are very rich in archaeology together. Then we have Syria and others. But Iraq is really very rich in archaeology, and you need uh, to protect it. So they have a very strong law, a very effective law. So this is the, the, the story of the, of the pipeline, the second pipeline never built. So, uh, there, Tel El Mukayyar is Ur, and this is Abu Tbeira. And, uh, excuse me, uh, yes, and as you can see, uh, the, the problem is, which canal on which canal did uh, Abu Tbeira lie at that time? Do we know the name of that canal? Do we know how the canal, uh, uh, the, the, how it ran and so on? So, in the left uh, uh, below, you can see the uh, work done by Wright in the 70s, well, in the 60s, let's say, uh, where he uh, made a, a survey of the area of Ur, and putting on a map all the sites he could find of whatever period. As you can see, the, from 175, 76, and so on, you can see a line. Even if you don't see a canal, there is the possibility that they lie on one canal, these sites. And so we think that perhaps it is the canal who, uh, go, going, running through Abu Tbeira, then went to Ur. The reason why uh, Wright could not uh, recognize or describe Abu Tbeira is that Abu Tbeira lies 15 kilometers far from Ur, and he had only a radius of 10 kilometers around Ur, so he could not see the uh, Abu Tbeira. Using one of the pits of the army of Saddam Hussein of the period, because this site was also used uh, at, during the first war, uh, Gulf War with, uh, as a, a place to, hit, to hide some, uh, uh, some uh, military staff. Even if it is not very clear, we have no information on that. It is more stories told by the pe people who live there. So you have, they are reliable only in part, let's say. But something is, must be true. And using that, we could uh, make a trench, a stratigraphic trench, which can give an idea of the uh, chronological span of the, of the, of the site. And uh, uh, we find only, uh, we could not reach the virgin soil because the, the pit was not uh, um, deep enough. In any case, we had a very good picture of what was the, the, the span, chronological span of the highest layers of the, of the, of the site. We have the transition from early dynastic to Akkadian, 2500, 2400 BC, until the end of the millennium. So, as far as we can judge now, the site has a lifespan. The, 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 the most important moment in the life of Abu Tbera was in the second half of the third millennium before Christ, from 2500 until 2000, more or less, uh, BC. We started excavating in the uh, southeastern part of the Tel. We did it because we could use this satellite imagery. This satellite imagery was given to us, uh, and we have always thanked her in every conference, by Elizabeth Stone, who is now excavating Ur, as you know. And uh, uh, she was kind enough to show us this, uh, uh, to share with us the pictures she had for the project of protecting the Iraqi heritage through the satellite imagery. It was the idea to see what happens having imagery of different periods uh, of the same site. In this image, you can see this huge structure, a building, let's say. Huh? And we were very interested to see what kind of, of building this could be. So we decided to start from this part of the tent. 
what we found immediately was a cemetery area on the, on the, on the, on the north, uh, southeastern part where the, the building was. This means that uh, the area was abandoned and uh, the people who lived perhaps in the other part, in the northern part, we are going to speak about that later, in the northern part of the site, used that area for as a cemetery uh, without realizing that there, was, there were structures inside. They could brick, uh, make a hole where a wall was, so they had no idea. The, the building was completely eroded when the, the cemetery area was built. We have also subpavimental uh, graves, but it's another story. We, I'm speaking about the, uh, the necropolis, let's say. This little necropolis we have found on, the, uh, on this uh, north, uh, southeastern area. What is interesting is that, uh, here you can see the an image of the excavation at that time, it is uh, three years ago. What is interesting is that we have found a lot of different practices of inhumation, different way to inhumate, to bury people. And this is quite unexpected uh, for us uh, because uh, this means that perhaps different people from different tradition must have uh, lived there. We have, for instance, uh, many sarcophagi, like this one. This one, this is the picture before excavating. As you can see, it is possible to detect, to see a hole in the northwestern part of the, of the sarcophagus. That means that it was looted in antiquity, not in modern times. It was already looted, let's say, some years after it was uh, buried. Huh? Here you have another one, also looted in antiquity, and you see that only the, the lower part of the body has, uh, uh, is uh, seen, still uh, uh, to be seen and to be found. But it was very rich with a very huge uh, assemblage. You know that uh, the graves uh, had uh, more or rich different assemblages which are very important for us because the pottery is a very clear chronological indicator, very clear, can be a clear indicator, especially if you have a good reconstruction of the, of the sequence, of the uh, pottery sequence, which is not the case in South Mesopotamia, by the way, because all the, the pottery of South, South, Southern Mesopotamia has been reconstructed, uh, reconstructed according to the information from sites from the north, mainly more or less. And uh, so this is the, the... We also had earth graves uh, with, uh, with very rich assemblages. What you see in the middle is called a stem dish, or fruit stand also called. And uh, it is a, a clear indicator of the uh, last phase of the early dynastic period, let's say. Uh, this is the building as it stands now. The building uh, I spoke to you about in the, at the beginning of the... Be, where, uh, it, which lies in the southeastern part of the Tel. And you see that it is very huge. It is more, almost 700 square meters. It was empty, as it is very common in the, in the case of, the, of, uh, of uh, Mesopotamian, southern Mesopotamian archaeology. So it is not easy to understand which was the use of this building, if it was one use or different uses. But uh, we have tried to, to uh, understand the, the kind of use which was done in these uh, rooms, in these spaces, by using uh, some devices which are generally used by the prehistorians, just to, to find out to, to what was done, what kind of work was done on the, on the, on the specific area. But it is not easy for us to say what the entire structure was. It is more than a house. It can be what we call perhaps a oikos, a place where there was a house and at the same time an, an activity, a, 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 some activity. But it is not very clear for us in this moment what we can say about that. This is the, the reconstruction of the, of, the, of the planimetry there. So... Uh, what is uh, uh, one aspect which was interesting for me was that we found uh, very often in the inside the rooms, along the walls or in the corners of the of the of the room, we found uh, 
what are called in, the, in literature the foundation bowls. That is, bowls that are put inside a room when the pavement, in, in, a, in the moment in when the pavement is done, in order it was thought to be a reason, a re religious reason to behind that. Uh, but we, have not, we do not know anything like this in the text. And then do we have uh, Lisha, Lisha Romano, who's the co-director, by the way. I am a philologist. I teach Assyriology. The uh, uh, archaeological soul of the project is Lisha Romano, who could not come, unfortunately, today <laughs> to, to you. But uh, she had, had the idea that they can be lamp, used as lamp. They, they was inside oil, and they could make uh, light in the night. And there are two because the, 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 the upper one served as uh, just to, 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 say, to extinguish the fire, I mean, the, the light. It's clear that, well, it is a possibility. But what is interesting is that we found a lot of these uh, situations in Abu Tbaira. Uh, we, I told you that we also have subpavimental tombs, that is, uh, tombs which are inside the house. Mainly they are of children, but we also found a very nice one of two adults, uh, a male and a female, uh, which was put uh, in the space between two rooms where the door was, inside the door. And uh, it is uh, also very uncommon to have two, at least in, the, in, the, in Abu Tubeira, it is the first one we find with two bodies and with a rich... Um, uh, assemblage, as you can see. Then we went to excavate in the northeastern part of the tell, where we also found a building. Uh, this building is, uh, we found uh, some uh, rooms, but also in this case it was very difficult for us to say what was the, the vocation, what was the use of these spaces. Huh? Uh, this year we have uh, this is the situation this year and in the as you can see in the south eastern part there is an we say an interment they they put soil inside to close the space which was there before it is not clear for us why they did that but it is clear this year they have done this we had some difficulties to detect the, the space and now it's clear why because it was covered, it was filled with soil. But, but we have no idea why they did this so far. Then we uh, have, uh, this year we opened a new area, which is called Area 6, also in the northeastern part of the Tell, not uh, more, uh, more near, nearer to the, to the center of the Tell, what we call the Acropolis, even if it is not very high. The highest point is four meters, so it is not really very high. Like in Syria you have, or in northern Iraq, you have much more sedimentation of this. So we have found uh, a structure where, of which we have only found the, uh, the foundations. What you see is what remains 20 centimeters of a wall of a building which, uh, of which only the foundations uh, remain. And... Uh, this is from uh, above the situation. We have found this circular or oval, let's say, uh, con uh, construction building, or let's say structure, because we do not know what the vocation is. Of the and now it is, as you see, uh, we have still to open the next year the area in order to, to detect what's happening of the structure after the, 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 the end of the excavation area. So the, the next year we are going to do to do this, inshallah, if we find the funds for, for that. What, what is interesting is that in this uh, structure, which was uh, built uh, by, with uh, uh, brick, uh, bricks, I mean baked bricks and mud bricks, we have found two inscriptions, two bricks of the same, with the same inscription of the king Amar Suena. Amar Suena is the third king of the third dynasty of Ur, and it is a, a very typical inscription of him. It is an inscription where he says only the titles of him. No other information is given. It is very common, especially in the western part of, of Sumer, in the western part of the, of the Ur-3 rail. It's much, much more 
rare in the west, in the east, along the Euphrates is, the, is to be found this inscription. What you see is a picture with an RTI, what we say. RTI is uh, a device which gives you the possibility to pay, take a picture and then to move the picture as if you have the tablet or the object in your hands. It takes a lot, a lot of time to, make, to take pictures of, of, the, of, uh, of this, and so we do not do it for every object. But for the important ones or for the meaning, uh, meaningful, we try to do this, even if it takes, I tell you, a lot of time, especially when you are working in Iraq and you have to take information in the quickest possible way because then you have 10 months to work at home on this documentation. This is the, the other one. Now, uh, I would like to tell you something. This is the picture, a picture of what the work we have done archaeologically and what the more important areas that we have detected in, the, in these seven years. But what is important for me now is to, to show you what the, the fact that when we went and worked to Iraq, uh, we have been also used by Iraqis to make other activities which were very important at that time. Now, it, it's not easy to understand, but when we started uh, eight years ago, they needed a lot of different things. So they uh, asked us, for instance, to work on a file, which was accepted in 2017, for entering the marshes, and three important sites of southern Iraq, Aridu, Ur, and Uruk, inside the list under the protection of the UNESCO, the World Heritage List, or called the World Heritage List. So we have been working in this. And we could show, for instance, which was very important, well, two words on this, uh, on this uh, UNESCO file. The file is divided in two parts. A landscape environmental one, which is the marshes, which is a very important landscape of southern Mesopotamia, very important not only for Iraq, but for the entire area and the cultural part, that is three places which are connected with the history of the marshes. I repeat, Aridu, Ur, and Ur. What was important for us was to show the Thai relationship of the culture of uh, Iraq, of the, of the, of the marshes, with the, with, with the archaeology. Why? Because the three places are very far from the marshes today. So it was important to show the way in which these sites, which are now very far from the landscape of the marshes, were in a way tied with the marshes. How? So, for instance, we found one day uh, a, a dish under which, a broken one as you can see, under which we found uh, fish bones, which were black. That is, they were uh, put on fire. Somehow they have been on direct, direct contact with the fire. This is the idea. We reconstructed, make the restoration of the, of the vase, and we have, and this is the, the, the result of the, of the work. Now, the only possibility for fish bones to be black is that they have been, at, I tell you, a direct contact with the fire. Now, the, the only possibility, or one of the possibilities, of a fish to be uh, cooked in this way is this one. This is Lisha, by the way, the, the co-director. That is, they, it is called masguf in the uh, Iraqi tradition. They cut the fish in two and they put it on the fire so that the fish bones are in direct contact with the fire. So this is a possibility. Uh, it is a joke, more or less, but it was important for us to help them to find a way to explain this because it was the, most, the weakest point of the file. How can you show the relationship of three sites so far from the marshes? So just, let's say, demonstrating, showing the, the cultural relationship, the material relationship. So this is one of that, uh, uh, of that uh, let's say, little help we gave, we gave to, to them. Then, another important aspect uh, of the uh, marshes is the use of reed for uh, building, construction, for making objects, and so on. So, 
we have found in, uh, uh, in Abu Tbera many times objects in, uh, in uh, reed mat, made in, uh, in reed, let's say, reed mat and other kind of objects. And uh, uh, as you can see, this, is, uh, this has been found in one room of, uh, of a southeastern building, the first building I showed you. As you can see, it is really very well preserved. It was for us a surprise uh, to, to see how well preserved was the reed mat uh, in, the, in, the, in the room. And uh, also the workers were very excited when we found that and they took, took a lot of time for them to work and they were, were very careful. By the way, uh, uh, just a word on the workers. Our workers are quite able to, to understand the soil. They see the color better than us. They have the feeling for the consistency of the, of the soil more than us. Because when you excavate, you, we excavate in a stratigraphic way. What does it mean? We follow layer after layer what has happened, starting from the newest activity to the oldest. To do that, it is necessary to recognize every activity in itself. It's very important to recognize that something has happened there and how in order to excavate, excavate it, dig it, as a unity, as something which is understandable in itself. To do that, you need to recognize that. And at the beginning, especially at the beginning, we, have, we had no knowledge or a very few knowledge of, the, of, the, of this kind of, of problem, this problematic, let's say. And we have had a very a big help from our workers who had been... Uh, also had, had been working with, uh, with other missions, Iraqi and Europeans, before the war. So they had a very good experience on the field, on the site. So, this is a new reed mat, made uh, two years ago or three years ago in the, in the marshes by Abu Haider. I don't know, pe people who have been in Iraq know him because he's the the boatman who uh, is a very good friend of Jasim al-Assadi, who is the director of Nature Iraq, and is the one who wrote the file for the marshes to, for UNESCO. And uh, he is a poet. He has a very nice voice. He always sings and makes things, uh, the, the uh, let's say, historical, traditional songs of the of their area. And he is very good in doing the, uh, the, the, these rhythms. By the way, uh, in the marshes, there is, there is no specialization. Everyone generally is able to do all the works. There, are, there is very few speciali specialization in, uh, in the marshes. So all the family is able to do that. But he is particularly, uh, let's say, uh, able to, to do this kind of work. And uh, it is why Jasim took a picture of him and gave it to us to show what was happening. So... I told you that the reed mat are used also for building purposes. And we, we have found once in a room this round trace. These round traces had the imprint of reeds. So we had to try to understand this archaeological, let's say, situation. And uh, it is for us, it is obvious for us now, that it is the, the trace of a, a reed uh, pillar which is used to strengthen the uh, houses, what they call mudif. Mudif means house of the guest. A mudif is an important part of a village because uh, uh, a guest can be hosted there for one week without paying anything, no more than one week, I've been told. But for one week, you can live there with them, eat with them, and without any problem. And it is only for the guests. It is not used by the people of the village. Only for ceremonial purposes. We are not sure that in Abu Tbera there is the same ceremonial situation. But for sure, there is the same building, uh, uh, the building uh, activity, building, uh, let's say, uh, procedure. Then, once we have found uh, another interesting uh, 
let's say, archaeological context, we have found in one room a reed mat all over the pavement, and inside, all over the, the reeds, the reed mat, there were holes, little holes, which had been done after the reed mat had been put in situ, had been put on the pavement. It's clear because we, you see that the, the, the reed mat goes inside the, the hole itself. Then we, had found, we found in the middle of the, of the room a fire structure without any reed, where, the reed, where there was no reed. So it was very difficult for us to understand how to cope the two uh, things we, have, we had in front of us, that is the reed mat and the holes, and the fire, which is something which is very far from the from a reed mat. It was for sure stratigraphically at the same, the same uh, stratigraphy, the same uh, layer. Then suddenly we have found this picture of the, of the marshes. This picture has been taken by uh, Young in the 60s. So it is, seems to be very old, but it is not so old as one can imagine. And as you can see, there, is, there are uh, wooden uh, post, let's say, uh, which are used to keep the ceiling, which is in this case is made by also uh, reed mat. And it is very common in the marshes to find such situation. That is, that they use the, uh, the, um, uh, as ceiling, the reed mat kept in by uh, the, 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 this uh, wooden uh, poles. What is interesting is that they are tapered, as you see. Tapered is the word? You understand? Yes, tapered, yeah. So it is, uh, because it was something strange for us to see how little the, 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 the holes were. But now it is clear why they were so, so little, not so big. Because they are tapered. And it is done, we have been told by the people who live in the marshes, it is done in order to avoid, to destroy the reed mat very soon. To avoid, to... to the, that you have to change this very, very often. It is very easy to make this, but in any case, it's a work. It takes work, time from other activities. Then, another picture of the same book explained us what was happening with the, with the fire, as you can see. The, uh, the fire, uh, the reed mat was cut in the place where the fire uh, was installed, and it was possible to have such a situation. It was quite clear. What I'm trying to say is that uh, while we were helping, let's say, the file, the UNESCO file to be written, we were also understanding very much from the archaeological situation that we could see on the, in, the, in our site. So this was a proof for them and for us that really the, uh, the culture of the marshes can give a clue to understand the archaeological context. It's not just, uh, let's say, uh, something which you uh, do uh, forcing the situation. It is really something which can help you to understand. For us, it was a very interesting experience. Um, the file has been written uh, by specialists in Manama, not in Iraq, because they were not able to do that. So we have been invited in Manama, in Bahrain, two times in order to do that. And I remember that they were quite surprised by the, the fact that such uh, similarities could be detected and in a way could be also used to uh, write the, uh, the file itself. Because they were very worried. Because while it was very clear the reason why the marshes as a landscape, as an environmental situation, could enter the world list, world heritage list, it was not so clear why the sites had to be put inside the same list. But at the end, they accepted this. It was a very a great victory for Iraq to, to see this, the, the fact that it was accepted by the UNESCO. In, in Turkey, by the way. It was in Istanbul. Perhaps today it would have been not so easy as before, but at that time, two years ago, the, the situation was quite different. Uh, always... Uh, in order to write this UNESCO uh, file, we had been asked to prepare 
some, uh, let's say, uh, project of conservation of the main monument of the city of Ur. At that time, nobody was working in Ur. We had the house of the mission inside, inside Ur, so they asked us to, to, to do something. We applied for money to the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and we had been lucky enough to get this money to make three projects. Three, uh, three projects. This is a, a contour map of, the, of, the, of Ur with a buffer zone. Buffer zone is, a, is a, a zone which is not archaeological in itself, but, but which must be kept free from any activity, modern activity, building, and so on. So, what is it? Oh. I'm going too, too quick. <laughs> so, the first activity was done on the monument which is very uh, in endangered in this moment. It is called the E Dublamach, or Dublamach. Uh, the Dublamach is a little uh, structure, which was not a temple, perhaps it was a court justice for, for making processes. And as you can see, there is the oldest arch in the history of uh, architecture. And uh, uh, this um, structure is Endangered, especially because of the concrete which has been put over the structure by Woolley himself when he discovered it in 1923 or 24. It was the new, a new method to, to work with, uh, with the conservation and restoration at that time. It was, the concrete had been just invented and in, discovered in that period. So it, was, it could seem a sort of panacea, as we say, a sort of of something which can be used for everything. It is very heavy. But it must be said that in this moment, what helps this monument to stay as it is, is this concrete which has been put over, over it. So we have, are planning to put it out, to, to, to take it out. But it is not very easy to do that because everything will collapse. So we are working, uh, we are thinking of a, a possibility of doing that. But before doing that, we have been asked to make a, a project of conservation of the site, of the, of the monument. And so with our architect thought of something like this. To, to keep, uh, with, it is, seems to be heavy, but it is not heavy. It's something which only uh, uh, is leans to the, to the monument in a way. And this, I tell you, it is not a restoration. It is a conservation project in order to try to keep the monument waiting for the money for a real uh, activity of, res of restoration, which is much more expensive than, the, than, than the, the conservation, of course. Uh, I enjoyed very much this, uh, this work because uh, I could make something which had not been done since many years, that is a complete map of the written inscribed bricks which are still visible on the, uh, on, uh, the uh, Dublamach, on the monument. It was very interesting for us to see the different layers of construction or rebuilding or reconstruction uh, of older conservation. I mean, in the, in the, uh, in the, uh, um, the last one was in the first millennium BC. How readable it is, the, these, recon, uh, these reconstructions are, when you look at the uh, inscribed bricks, you can detect immediately which part has been rebuilt and which part has been brought to build. We are now going to speak of this map here. So, another aspect which was very important was to have an, an updated version of the map of the city of War and of the monuments of War because there was no one. So, we decided to use a drone, a fixed wing, he said, we have various types. This is very good for long distance uh, activity and flights. And we could make this map that you see on the left. We have been lucky in this case because we could work four days after the rain, uh, there, there was a rain. This is good because the rain 
let the grass come out, and the grass come out according to the walls which are, or the structures which are underneath. So you can see very well the planimetry of everything if you are lucky enough. Elizabeth Stone told me that when she was making the project of Ur, she was trying to find, to buy, because you have to buy, the imagery, the satellite imagery, images, taken after a rain had been, was there. But it was very difficult because there is no uh, record of rains in that area, strange enough. By the way, when we are there, the rain is something which in, uh, makes impossible to excavate, of course, especially because there is uh, clay there. So the, the water stays for a very long time. So if it rains heavily, it is one day perhaps, but you, you have to wait one week before you start again working. So we hope that never this happens when we are there. Only one, one, uh, one time we had so much water in, in, in uh, uh, Nasiria, there was more than one, one meter of water. But it was only one case in, in eight years. Uh, so, uh, so we have been quite lucky because it is, uh, the, I, mean, I was saying that when you are there, you cannot foresee the, 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 the rain. Because also if you look at the weather report, they are never accurate. It can rain and nobody knows that. It is better to ask the old people living there who says, ah, if the wind comes from, <laughs> so it is uh, possible that we have the rain. We rely very much on the people there, by the way, for our security, for our life there, for our work there, and uh, uh, it has been a, a discovery for us, the, the Iraq also from this point of view. I have been working there, but especially in the center, big centers like Mosul, or Erbil, or Baghdad. But to live in a village is an experience, really an experience. Uh, especially for the women, I have to say, because the men only speak about men things. They speak about football. I do not know anything about football, so I cannot speak with them about that. But the women are very lucky because they live in, they can enter, which is impossible for a man. They play the part of the house where the women live. And they uh, have a lot of stories to tell. They cannot tell because they promise not to tell anything to us. But I invite them very much because they see the Iraq from another point of view, which is impossible for me to see. But it's another story. So, I, I don't think it's not working, no. Because it is a little uh, video. Ah, yes. Strange enough, now it worked. It is the way... A little a video which has been taken by an Iraqi friend of us when we were do doing this. This is our topographer. It's going to be interesting to see how it works. Because you have to make the plan for the flight, and you make it very easily with the computer. Then you have to launch the, the, the drone, and it goes doing what you have been... You have, must not guide it. I mean, there is a, a, the possibility to foresee the work. By the way, we lost at the end of this flight the, because it's not very clear how. But then a, a family of the marshes came to take us, <laughs> of not marshes, excuse me, the Bedou, Bedouin living there with the animals. They found them somewhere and they took back to us. It was also in the, in the newspaper of Nasiria, this fact, because it was, everybody was looking for it everywhere. We did not give money for that. Uh, just, it, it was just a pleasure for them to, to do something for us. This is the, the way in which we have done. And this is the second project we have done. One uh, of the main uh, uh, monuments of Ur is uh, the so-called Royal Mausolea of the Third Dynasty of Ur. Amarswena and Shulgi are we are not sure that these two kings are buried there or have been buried there, but this is a way with, with their code, let's say. It is a, a hypogea chamber put one in front of the other, and uh, they have static problems because they are vaulted, and it is uh, something which is very typical of the Sumerian architecture, by the way. But this, but this how big they are is interesting. Let's see if we can... <coughs> eh, yes. This is a 3D reconstruction of the two chambers that you can see here that we have done using millions of points taken with uh, 
laser scanner and then uh, elaborated from these points. So you see how it works. It is, they are one in front of the other with stairs going from one, uh, one of them to the other. Yeah, so uh, this is also interesting because you know the 3D, admittedly, is not very interesting from the scientific purposes. You are not going to use it for for science. It is not giving you information, special information, but it is very important for the presentation of the data because it makes many things clear at sight, <laughs> just looking at it. So this is the, the important aspect of the... So this is the project that, we, uh, that our architect has sought for the two mouse layer, to make a vault which can, I repeat, it is not a restoration project, it's a conservation project, just to keep the monument as it is, waiting for money uh, fun, funds enough to be uh, uh, restored in the proper way. So this is the what yes. Sir. The agreement with the uh, uh, with the Iraqis was that we would have done the the projects and they would have put the money for the, the realization. But unfortunately, the price of the oil was very high at the beginning of our work and very low at the end. <laughs> so they told us that they have not money enough to do that. So they have the project there somewhere in Baghdad and perhaps they are going to, uh, to do something in the, uh, of this. But so far, nothing has happened. And last. The last uh, work will be on the Zikura. The Zikurat is a temple. Uh, a temple which was, you see, it is a platform which is built in order to keep what is built up uh, above it. Huh? It is not, uh, there is nothing inside, differently from the pyramids of Egypt. At the beginning of the uh, history of the archaeology in Mesopotamia, people, or Musdra Sam, for instance, in Zippar, was sure that there was something inside. For him, it was impossible for this, uh, for this, perhaps you know this man, he was uh, uh, a pro, uh, let's say, uh, a person who was a sort of advisor of the uh, British for the archaeology of the area. And uh, he was sure that something, a, a treasure, let's say, in this way, was hidden inside the Zikra. So he used the dynamite to, to, to break it, especially in Zippar, it's very, very clear. What is interesting is that uh, the, uh, the uh, upper part of the, of the ziggurat vitri vitrified, became like, uh, like glass, let's say. And uh, 20 years later, someone thought that it was a ramp for the launch of missiles of, of aliens coming from, uh, from outer space. And it was a, a long story, by the way, until it was clear that it was the Hormuz Drassam who had done this uh, kind of activity. Uh, here you can see uh, the, the Zikurat as it stands now. And it is a, a, a restoration which has been done in the 60s, at the beginning of the 60s by Taha Baker, which is, who is a very famous archaeologist of Iraq now. He died. One of the most famous, by the way. He died in an accident, by the way. Uh, here above you can see the way in which it was when Woolley worked there. It is taken in 1923 or 4. And there you can see a reconstruction in the 19th, 18th century, end of the 18th century. So the problem of the Zikurat is that we have to find a way to defend it from the water, especially from the water. <laughs> Tel al muqayyar means the tel full of bitumen, of oil, qayr in, in Arabic. Because probably the Zikurat was still very black and and uh, oily when, uh, uh, for, for a longer period because it was used by the Sumerians, by the Babylonians, in order to, uh, against the water, to make it waterproof. So perhaps the, the, the name of the site of Ur comes from this big, uh, huge use of, of uh, bitumen made by the Sumerians when building the Zikurat. So, 
this is what I had to tell you <laughs> on our work in Iraq, what we have been doing in these eight years, and uh, uh, not only the scientific activities, I tell you, because they are important, but they are under scrutiny. I mean, uh, they change according to the, to, the, uh, to, to the findings, I mean. But what is interesting is that we have opened, and we are very proud of that, a new, uh, a new let's say, era of excavations in Iraq. A new, uh, and we are also presenting to the world a new Iraq, a different Iraq from the one you see in the, in the media. And then, personally, it is always my pleasure to, sh to share this experience which is the most important, both human and scientifically, for my entire life. In my entire life, I never had such a feeling of doing something so exciting and beautiful. So thank you very much for your, for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. It was a yes. I mean, tremendous, wide-ranging talk, touching on all sorts of exciting initiatives uh, for the future. And I'm sure there are plenty of questions. So, what Whatever you... question. Also, curiosities. <laughs> How you can survive in Iraq not Liking football. Like? <laughs> Not liking football. Yeah. Jane. No, they the range uh, from the uh, early dynastic 3B, as far as we can say now, up to the Akkadian period. So far in the southeast, we have no, uh, no grave of uh, later than uh, Akkadian. And also Akkadian is not so clear, but uh, no three, uh, or, or Babylonian, uh, we have no old Babylonian all over the site. Uh, so we, have, we cannot say anything about the, the old Babylonian period if ever, if there is one or not, or on Abu Dhabi. But in the south, the range is between the end of the early dynastic and the Akkadian period. There's some really interesting pottery shapes there. Yeah? <laughs> unusual, they're not what you would expect further north, whereas you say, most of them are comparative material Yeah. So we really look forward to seeing it published, so we can read yeah. it over Alicia is working on the book, so that you are, <laughs> where she will thank you very much for <laughs> for your help, because we, we shared with uh, uh, Jane Moon and Robert Killick and their team the house in, uh, in, uh, in, in Ur, the same house of the mission. I wish you to have such the experience to share the house with a person <laughs> who makes no problem at all. We had, it was a pleasure for us to, to, to have that. Now they are working in another place, in Basra, and it's a pity for us because we were very happy to have you as, <laughs> as a co-owner uh, owner of the house where we live. And thank you for that, by the way. Thank you very much. Any other thoughts or comments, questions? Uh, how, how does your drone work? How? Your drone. Yes. Yes, because, yeah, no, because uh, he, uh, you know that the, the what we call it, the propeller yeah. was uh, behind, not in front of the... So it was dangerous for him to launch in this way because it could hurt himself. So he had to do this, <laughs> this uh, gesture. It's only, it's the way. He told me it is as if you have to put something on a, on a uh, scarf, yes, something like this. It is, it's why he did this, uh, this movement. So it just has one Yes, just one, yes, yes. It works quite well, by the way. Yeah? This, uh, it was very big, two meters, by the way. It doesn't seem so, but it was quite big. Also a nice, uh, nice thing to do. But unfortunately, we, are, we bought two other drones to work uh, there. But they are now in Basra. It is in the airport, I mean, in the custom area. And we are trying to take them out, but so far, we have not succeeded. And it is a present for the Iraq, by the way. Yeah? Just to give you an idea of what rule of law is in Iraq. When we started, there was no rule at all 
for instance, how to take samples of soil, of pottery, of bones at home to study. Nobody knew what to do. We were the first one to do this. So, and every year was different. According to the person we spoke with, it was, there was another question, another, excuse me, another answer to our problem. So now things are slowly becoming more and more effective. It, it, it is a country where you can do difficult things very easily, and easy things can become an immensely difficult, let's say. Yeah, it's uh, something I understand as a Mediterranean man, of course, but in a way, uh, it also escapes to my mind also. <laughs> it's difficult, but I, things are changing. I, Iraq is on the way to normalization, and uh, it is uh, an important thing to say. I've seen a different Iraq since eight years, completely different from the beginning up to now. Please, yes, sir. Uh, yeah, I'm, uh, first of all, I'm Iraqi and I used to be a translator in Iraq uh, for many missions that came in the years. And anyway, so my big question to you is, uh, was it easy in the beginning, at least, at the beginning of your work, was it easy to communicate with the Iraqis? I mean, uh, uh -huh. after the war, after the, the sanctions, after It's a, it's difficult, so it's a very good question, both. <laughs> the, the, the fact is that we arrived there uh, after the Italians... Well, let me make a little prehistory of the, of the project. I started working in Iraq in the PRT, Provincial Reconstruction Team, in the Talil Air Base, when the Italian uh, stopped using the money for the funds for the military aspect and started using the money for the civil reconstruction of the country. I did not want to work in a country which was occupied. It was my idea. So I did not go there before that. But as soon as they changed their, uh, the, the goal of the money to be used there, I went to Ur, to, to, to the Talil Air Base, uh, with a project of restarting some activity, asking them what they wanted. So we made some archaeology, some philology, I bought books for them, and so on. And from that, all, everything started. So when we arrived to, to work there with excavation, we arrived when the Americans were, were not there. When we arrived, the Americans were going away. We saw the long uh, sequence of American uh, uh, lorries and so going uh, away when we arrived. So there was, some, uh, there was a, a prehistory of our re relationship with them. And uh, it was for us very easy. i tell you one story. Uh, when we arrived there, the Italian ambassador told me to have a low profile. Because nobody knew what, what could happen. Because really it was something new at the time. It was 2010. And we tried to do that, but it wasn't possible. Because as soon as we arrived, the press, the journalists, the radio, television came to, to us because we were the first to go there. And then they made uh, Ali Ashayal, who is, uh, 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 works for, for Al Fayyad, the television channel, decided to make a, a, a documentary film on our work. So he made this. Uh, we were there in uh, February, like now. And the 18th of February is my birthday. So the students get made, uh, I play guitar, so bought me a guitar, and I play a song, an Italian song, just to, to test the guitar, to, to, uh, to be happy with them. And Ali Ashayal made a little, the film of this. And then, uh, uh, in the documentary film, there is 10 minutes of me playing the guitar, of everybody laughing. And this was so, ex so nice for them that it became a, a little, you find sometimes they put it in the television. Like uh, when they have nothing to do, they put me playing guitar. So, <laughs> so everybody knows us. And it was, my, they, it was impossible for us to have a low profile in that, uh, in that. So just to give you a hint of how we worked at the beginning. But Jane was with us more or less from the very first moment. So she knows, and they know very well what I'm saying, how, how people reacted to, to our work. And uh, um, as for the second question, I've been studying Arabic. I can read it well, with the vocabulary, admittedly. Uh, but I, uh, as a philologist, unfortunately, I made the stupid uh, thing to study it as a dead language, not as a li living one. Because you know that there is a diglossy, a very strong you know, 
very well. So you, when you study the uh, literary Arabic, you have to study also a dialect, otherwise you don't speak with anybody. You only speak without understanding anything. So it was like, now I'm, of course, I'm trying to, to, to understand because it is something, well, I use the Arabic for, with the people every day. It's not difficult. They are very open, so with us, so it's very easy with the workers. Uh, we understand each other very well, even if we don't speak very well Arabic. But uh, it's becoming more and more important to know Arabic if you live so long for in, in, uh, in Iraq. I remember, excuse me if I speak about my experience, but I think it would be interesting too. Uh, the first time I visited uh, uh, Nasiriya, it was in 1994. With the colleagues, uh, we went to visit Ur and we spent some days there. And uh, I had a terrible memory of Nasiriya. It's a, a city, a new city, built in 1850. To just for the, the workers of the oil companies and for the British army. So it is very new in Iraq. It is a very. But, and then I could never imagine that moment that this city could, would have been one of the most important cities of my life. <laughs> so you, you never know in your life when you. But at that time I had this. I remember this and I feel also guilty for my feeling of that time <laughs> with them. Yes, yes, this is something which happened. The main problem with these tribes were not the war, the second world Gulf war, but the problem with Saddam Hussein, who built in 19, I don't remember, 95? I don't remember, built a so-called third channel in order to take water from the two rivers and, uh, and uh, in order, so that people could not hide. The tribes were against him, as you know very well, so that people could not hide. And it was a big problem for the marshes, for the landscape, and for environment, and so on. And it was the moment when they left the area. But after, soon after 2003, they came back. So now there are many, many people who came back, and they have two passports, the Iranian one and the Iraqi one, because they left to go to Iran. And Iran is their Shia, so they give, gave immediately the, the, the passport to them. And now uh, we have a good friend of us, who is Amir Doshi, he has a, 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 a company for translating the documents and is working very much with documents from Iranian, from Persian, because the people who have been there because of this situation can get $10,000 from the state. So he's translating a lot of these documents for, for the, just to give you an idea of how it works in Iraq. But yes, you're right, they came back uh, uh, soon after the war. By the way, uh, Ajasim al-Assadi, I told you, before the director of Natural Iraq told me that when they closed the third channel, in six months everything was again there. So nature is very strong <laughs> in Iraq, especially in southern Iraq. Okay, that's terrific. Thank you so much indeed. And I'm now going to formally ask uh, Dr. Augusta McMahon to give the four vote of thanks. Well, thank you, Franklin. Uh, I should say that. Uh, graduate students, so we've been friends for longer than I think either one of us uh, care, to, care to think about. Uh, anyway, it's been fascinating to see uh, just the incredible richness of the past, of uh, past archaeological record of Iraq, and also the incredible diversity of the material culture and micro-environmental regions. Uh, also brilliant to uh, see the amplification of these marsh resources and to, to notice just how in the past the exploitation of those 